Good evening and welcome to the news at 6. This is where we get you the day's top stories, the news updates and also what's developing. Also a special look today at the swine flu outbreak. What can you do to avoid it? I'm Tracy Chilchi and here's a look at the headlines. Prime Minister Modi assures strong action against attacks on any religious group. His first sus message in the backdrop of repeated attacks on Christian institutions in the capital. Flurry of preventive measures announced against swine flu across the country after sharp rise in casualty figures. A hundred fresh H1N1 deaths reported since Saturday. Hopes of an end to the political stalemate in Jammu and Kashmir. BJP and PDP make progress on resolution of sticking points. Both seek consensus on an 11-point common minimum program. Ceasefire between Ukraine and Russian rebels on the brink. Both sides refuse to pull out heavy arms as mandated by the Minsk agreement. Shelling continues in border areas. And at the ICC World Cup, New Zealand survives a minor scare to record their second win of the tournament, beats Scotland by three wickets. Our top story, Prime Minister Narendra Modi today reached out to the Christian community, the first time since repeated acts of vandalism in Christian establishments took place in the capital. Modi promised strong action against the culprits and complete rejection of intolerance by any group against any minority. The Prime Minister breaks what was interpreted as a disturbing silence while sending out a strong message to anti-secular elements. We cannot accept violence against any religion on any pretext and I strongly condemn such violence. My government will act strongly in this regard. The occasion was a function held by the Syro Malabar Church to celebrate the beatification of two Christian saints. Modi quoted Swami Vivekananda, the spirit of India's independent struggle and secular ideals while appealing to all groups to act with tolerance, as he stressed that development alone was his government's objective. My government will ensure that there is complete freedom of faith and that everyone has the un undeniable right to retain or adopt the religion of his or her choice without coercion. My government will not allow any religious group belonging to the majority or the minority to incite hatred against others overtly or covertly. After five attacks on churches and a break-in at a convent school in the capital since December, a shaken Christian community wanted a big dose of reassurance. The Prime Minister's words, as well as promises of punishment of the guilty from Finance Minister Arun Jaitley, were well received. You ignore those fringe elements. You, you listen to the Prime Minister and stick to what he says. I have no doubt he will be able to implement what he says. I have no doubt. At least uh, from what the Prime Minister has said, we can be sure that the Christian community is fully assured that uh, uh, we are not in, in any way going to face any kind of... Uh, threats or dangers or risks, uh, but then we are fully uh, part and parcel of the nation as Christians. Members of the Christian community in India had staged a silent protest and candlelight march in Bangalore earlier this month against the spate of alleged hate crimes against them. Prime Minister Modi's words come as a soothener, at least for now. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Meanwhile, amid reports that the political stalemate in Jammu and Kashmir could end soon, the BJP and the PDP leaders admit there are some issues still to be settled between the two parties. The PDP, as reported earlier, has sought consensus on an 11-point common minimum program in the state. After 15 rounds of negotiations, the BJP and the PDP almost on the verge of signing the deal of forming the coalition government in Jammu and Kashmir. Minister of State in the PMO Jitendra Singh met Jammu and Kashmir Governor Anand Vora on Tuesday, although he called the meeting personal. This is purely a personal meeting and there is, as I said, there is a wedding in the family, so I have come over here just to extend an invitation personally. Sangathan ki or se kuch ek logon ko adhikrit kiya gaya hai is charcha ke liye. 
हमारे लिए उचित नहीं होगा और ये उन्हीं के ध्यान में है उन्हीं की जानकारी में The BJP admits it still has issues with the PDP over some issues. Reports say the PDP is insisting on written assurances on the two ticklish issues of maintaining status quo on Article 370 and the Armed Forces Special Protection Act. There are issues to be discussed between the two parties. I think it's too early for me to really give any time frame or to spell out issues on which the discussions are currently happening. Meanwhile, taking pot shots at the proposed alliance, Congress and other political parties have questioned the delay on the part of both parties in coming to an agreement. If the PDP and the BJP can come together, this means that the sun can rise from the west. Because on one hand, you have the BJP, which wants Article 370 to be deleted from the Constitution. On the other hand, you have the PDP. which wants to take the state back to the 1952 delhi declaration a lamb and a wolf can't travel uh, in the same boat can't is not possible that i know and i believe that even if under compulsion to gain power in jammu and kashmir pdp and bjp try to form a government it cannot last long PDP chief Mufti Mohammad Saeed is likely to meet Prime Minister Narendra Modi soon. The final call over the proposed alliance and government formation in the valley is expected to be taken by the Prime Minister. Bureau report Rajya Sabha TV. We'll keep an eye on the situation there but now to our special focus from the Aligarh Muslim University announcing holidays for students till the 25th of February and the center ordering additional stocks of medicines and N95 masks the swine flu menace has triggered a flurry of preventive steps but so far the measures have had no effect on the number of cases or the casualty figures with over 100 deaths being reported in just the last 3 days with 100 deaths in the last 3 days Swine flu has claimed 585 lives already this year. The central government is ordering additional medicines and diagnostic kits. 8423 people contracted swine flu this year. Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra are the worst affected with death figures of 165, 144, 76 and 58. Mere rishtedar hain unko yahan pe aaye hospital mein leke ki bhai swine flu hai karke to bhi yahan pe bahut acha facility hai. और यहाँ पर ट्रीटमेंट सुबह हम पाँच बजे आए उस टाइम से इलाज चालू है और यहाँ पर डॉक्टरों की टीम और मेडिकल फैसिलिटी सब बहुत अच्छा है कोई कर, कोई भी टाइप का तकलीफ हमको नहीं हुआ है राजस्थान रिपोर्टेड ट्वेल्व डेथ्स इन दीज लास्ट थ्री डेज देव एट फ्रेश कैजुअलिटीज ईच इन मध्य प्रदेश एंड गुजरात वाइल डेली एंड तमिलनाडु हैव रिपोर्टेड हाई इंसिडेंस ऑफ स्वाइन फ्लू केसेज द डेथ टोल इज रिलेटिवली लेस अकॉर्डिंग टू डॉक्टर्स मेनली ड्यू टू अई लेवल ऑफ अवेयरनेस एंड अ बेटर हेल्थ सेक्टर जिजाजी हमें रही है और छह सात दिन से भर्ती हैं इनका पॉजिटिव आया है रिपोर्ट इनकी जबलपुर से जब से यहाँ भर्ती हैं लेकिन आज सुबह सुबह वैसे तो धीरे धीरे इनको आराम लग रहा है पंजाब हैज द हाईएस्ट रेशियो ऑफ द नंबर ऑफ डेथ्स टू दोज अफेक्टेड बाय द डिजीज 25 आउट ऑफ 68 पीपल हु कॉन्ट्रैक्टेड द वायरस दिस ईयर डाइड ऑफ द वायरस हेल्थ मिनिस्ट्री ऑफिशियल सेंट्रल टीम टू द वर्स्ट अफेक्टेड स्टेट लाइक राजस्थान एंड गुजरात Doctors say there's no need to panic. The World Health Organization calls H1N1 a seasonal virus that is no more contagious or deadly than other flu viruses. It has also not mutated. Get tested for H1N1 if along with the flu symptoms of fever, runny nose, sore throat and congestion you have. Since the virus spreads through droplets expelled when an infected person coughs or sneezes, you can protect yourself from staying away from infected persons, frequently washing hands with soap and cleaning surfaces with disinfectant. Bureau report Raj Sabha TV. All right, let's find out more about this outbreak and why it's suddenly seeming to be something bigger than we saw last year. We got Rajiv Das Gupta who is the associate professor at the Community Medicine at JNU joining us in studio. Thanks so much Rajiv for joining us. Uh first of all the number of uh, deaths that we're seeing this time around almost 600 now in just this year itself. Uh is that alarming as uh, you know someone who you are of course looking at all sorts of uh you know strains like this uh in the past few years as well does this come as alarming to you uh just as your report said part of the concern is the unusually high proportion of death in some states mm. and that that's largely on account of uh patients coming in relatively late 
the other issue is that systems tend to get overlaid, overloaded if you make a whole lot of unnecessary admissions. Mm. Uh, in the clinical categorization, there, is, there are three categories, A, B and C and then B is divided into B1 and B2. It is really the C category of patients who really need to be hospitalized. The rest can be managed at home. Mm. Of course, that means that healthcare services ought to be better, community health workers ought to be keeping track and so on. Uh, what is also happening is that hospitals are tend to getting overloaded. There is an element of panic, yes. particularly in some states. And if you if you heard the report uh, very correctly, that Delhi and Tamil Nadu, which have actually had more than a thousand cases, mm. has actually had very few deaths. Yes. And uh, complications and deaths we would generally expect in very small children, or in elderly above yes. 65, or who have other comorbidities which means other coexisting illnesses which can worsen. Yes. Uh, as far as the strain is concerned, uh, Rajiv, correct me if I am wrong, but I, I, I read that this strain is actually not as uh, serious as the one that we actually saw in 2009, you know, when it hit Mexico and to, when to all uh, sorts of countries also uh, arrived in India. Uh, is that correct? Uh, and is that in fact uh, something that, you know, health authorities uh, you know, uh, should be uh, looking at uh, perhaps it's a relief uh, that it's not as strong as what we saw in 2009. Which is true that there, there are variations in strains, but yeah. the ultimate outcome given this strain depends or would depend uh, to a lot on how geared the health services are. Mm. The center and the states are working very closely, uh, but we probably need more strengthening at district levels where actually a whole lot of uh, cases need to be tackled, particularly in the western states, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, which yes. have actually seen most of the cases. That's right. Rajasthan, in fact, seeing a, a, a high amount of deaths in, in that particular state. Punjab, in fact, uh, as far as the amount of patients admitted to the number of deaths, actually the ratio, if you look at it, actually has more amount of uh, deaths, if, you know, if we look at the numbers. Uh, but at this point of time, uh, do you think the government, the health uh, workers are actually geared enough? Because this is a, a, a disease that actually, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, spikes up. Uh, you know, when the temperatures are balancing out a bit, it's not too cold, it's not too hot, and there's still about a month to go for that temperature to remain that way. Uh, so, are health authorities actually geared up to take a look at what could become, you know, perhaps an epidemic? Actually, uh, gearing up essentially entails addressing things at two levels. Mm. One is a whole lot of clinical care, which is required at district hospitals, at state hospitals, where respiratory failures need to be, ma to be managed where severe multi-organ failure needs to be managed. That's one kind of gearing up and that's what seems to be catching most of the attention. Uh, whereas, as I was pointing out earlier, uh, mm. the large, a very large majority of cases can actually be handled uh, at sub-district levels, including at home levels. Yes. And that's where uh, you have frontline workers being uh, coming into the picture and that's very, very large numbers. So, reaching out, connecting with those workers, the correct advisor is going at that level, the workers actually being able to monitor patients at home. Uh, these are the finer points which could actually uh, help in managing both at home level, preventing complications, yes. as well as reducing overloads of uh, the hospitals. All right, Rajiv Das Gupta, thank you so much for joining us and helping us take a closer look at the uh, spine flow outbreak that we're seeing in different states. Do take care, all of you who are watching us, and uh, we'll, of course, continue tracking the situation across the country. Meanwhile, we'll take a quick break here and still to come more news. At least six people are reported killed and seven injured in a suicide blast in Lahore. कब बनेगी जम्मू कश्मीर में सरकार पीडीपी और बीजेपी में गतिरोध बरकरार 370 और आफसपा कानून पर मतभेद जारी देखिए पहली खबर जम्मू कश्मीर सरकार आज शाम 7 बजे
Welcome back. You're watching the news at 6. In more news now, Sri Lankan President Maitripala Sirisena visited the Mahabodhi Temple in Bihar's Bodhgaya district. Sirisena offered special prayers at the Mahabodhi tree under which Lord Buddha is said to have attained enlightenment. The 1,500-year-old uh, Mahabodhi Temple is considered a lifetime destination for millions of Buddhists across the world. Sirisena, who didn't speak to the media, is also expected to visit Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh later. The Lankan president is in India on a four-day state visit, his first trip abroad since winning the presidential elections last month. Maharashtra police has launched a massive manhunt for the men who shot at senior CPI leader Govind Pansare and his wife in Kolhapur yesterday. Reports say that 20 teams have been formed and Kolhapur police are tracing all known history sheeters in the city even as teams have been sent out to nearby towns. Five people were detained on grounds of suspicion late last evening. Pansare, who has been a vocal critic of toll tax collections, is said to be recovering, but his condition remains critical. A bullet had hit his neck and another had bruised his uh, hand in the attack last morning. His wife has been hospitalized as well. Several leaders and activists have come forward to condemn the attack. It is a heinous crime. It is a violence against uh, political social activists. This should not be allowed and uh, I urge upon the Maharashtra government to do everything to pin down the if Maharashtra government should show its willpower and commitment to uphold the law and order. The state government will take immediate steps to apprehend the culprits and ensure that they are, uh, they are given the harshest punishment possible so that events, gruesome events of this nature do not occur again. Meanwhile, thousands turn out to pay last respects to R.R. Patil, the former Deputy Chief Minister of Maharashtra, at his cremation in his hometown Sangli. Patil was cremated with full state honours. Patil's body was brought to his hometown this morning and also taken to the agricultural produce market where thousands offered last respects. Top leaders in the Maharashtra government as well as the NCP were present at the last rites. The Maharashtra government declared a day's mourning in the state as a mark of respect. Patil died in a Mumbai hospital yesterday after a prolonged battle with oral cancer. And now more updates from across the country in Nationwide. A soldier of India's border security force, Prasant Singh, opened fire on a sleeping personnel allegedly after an argument killing a head constable at a BSF camp. The incident happened in Malda town in West Bengal. Four others were injured in the attack that took place this morning. Investigations are on. Seven top leaders of militant Alfred Karbi People's Liberation Tiger have been arrested in a joint operation by the army and police in Assam's Karbi Anglong district. The, the army said that the rebel group's commander-in-chief and its deputy were among the seven arrested. KPLT is fighting for a separate state of Karbi Anglong. Intermittent rains continued in Kashmir for the second day as the famous ski resort of Gulmarg experienced fresh snowfall. The Med Department has said that the prevailing disturbance would continue till the 24th of February. Gulmarg also recorded 12 inches of fresh snowfall during the night. Srinagar received 13.8 millimeters, millimeters of rain and recorded a low of 3.9 degrees Celsius. In other news, External Affairs Minister Shusma Saraj will reach Oman for her first bilateral visit to the country. She will be in the country for two days. Sushma Swaraj was invited to the country by her Omani counterpart Yusuf bin Alawi bin Abdullah, with whom she slated to hold talks on trade and security, including piracy and cyber crimes. Bilateral trade between Oman and India was around $5 billion per annum, and let's say it's likely to increase up to $6 billion in the next financial year. International news and the ceasefire in Ukraine shows disturbing signals of being on the brink of collapse as both rebels and government forces continue shelling in border areas. Both warring sides have also failed to withdraw heavy weapons from the front line as per the Minsk agreement deadline. Just 48 hours since the ceasefire was implemented and it's already nearing a total collapse. Skirmishes continue near the strategic town of Debalsev and in Luhansk. The Monday deadline passed with neither side willing to pull out weapons from the war zone. Five Ukrainian soldiers were killed. Several others were also injured. 
идти параллельно вместе с украинской стороной. По Минским соглашениям 16 числа мы должны начать отвод э, вооружения. Но на данный момент и закончим в течение 14 дней. Но... Умовою для отведения важного озброєння от линии зіткнення є выполнение первого пункта Минских договоренностей, а это прекращение огня. 112 обстрелов – это не є показник прекращения огня. The Organization for the Security and Cooperation in Europe, the monitoring agency for the ceasefire, is still trying to reach Ukraine after the rebels refused access. Top leaders from Germany, Russia and Ukraine held hectic meetings in an effort to hold the truce together. The mission assesses that the ceasefire is generally holding. However, incidents have been reported and directly observed by the mission which we have been reported. With regard to the Baltsevo, we only heard reports of and allegations of incidents and shellings and it is important that the mission is being granted access to the Baltsevo tomorrow. Russian President Vladimir Putin chaired a meeting of Russia's Security Council to discuss the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And as of now, the impasse shows no sign of a let-up from either side. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. At least six people were killed in a suicide blast in Lahore in Pakistan today. Government officials said the bomber blew himself up outside a police complex in the Kila Gujar Singh area. Several vehicles near the blast site caught fire. Reports suggest the Pakistani Taliban have claimed responsibility for the attack. The city police chief said the bomber's target appeared to be the police headquarters, but apparently the bomb went off prematurely. And now more international news in Global Buzz. Unidentified miscreants vandalized a Hindu temple in Washington state in the U.S., leaving behind hate messages against the Indian community. Reports said the attackers sprayed the swastika and painted Get Out on one of the walls of the temple in Seattle. The temple is one of the largest Hindu temples in the entire Northwest region. An investigation is underway. A magnitude 6.9 earthquake struck off the northeast coast of Japan today, followed by a tsunami alert from the Met Office. A tsunami advisory was, however, lifted two hours later. Reports say the earthquake shook much of northeast Japan and was felt in Tokyo, 690 kilometers away. In the U.S., a train hauling crew derailed in West Virginia on Monday, causing a massive fire that could be seen miles away. Reports say at least 14 cars were affected and one plunged into the Kanawa River. The train was hauling 109 cars from North Dakota to the coastal town of Yorkton. Uh, West Virginia Governor Tomlin issued a state of emergency after the derailment. Now to our special focus. Now, India is the largest importer of defense equipment. It's a situation that the government is hoping to change, mainly by focusing on its make and buy in India policy. The upcoming defense budget is expected to give shape to the government's intentions by including funds to encourage indigenization and modernization of our military equipment. Currently, we permit 26% FDI in defense manufacturing. The composite cap of foreign exchange is being raised to 49% with full management control, uh, Indian management and control through the FITB route. Even without the hike in the FDI cap announced by the finance minister last year, India depends heavily on foreign markets for defense equipment. Domestic equipment is just 30% compared to 70% that's procured from abroad. Which is why the upcoming budget is expected to focus on Make in India. And, uh, it's undoubtedly uh, indigenization, I think, goes at the very heart of our defense preparedness. Um, unless we start making major systems and integrating them at home, uh, we cannot be sure of our defensive capa uh, of defense capabilities overall. Um, and I think um, mm, uh, the Prime Minister is laying a lot of focus on it. Defense procurements are a key area where the Defense Minister wants to signal big changes through the budget. In the last three decades, India has evolved significant design capabilities, from the missile program to its nuclear propulsion program. The list includes a series of light helicopters, the Tejas light combat aircraft, the Arjun tank and an array of naval technologies that drive warship building. Then there are safeguarded technologies in electronic warfare, combat management systems and secure communications. However, CAG is not happy. 
As it points out, 90% of the systems and subsystems of the Dhruv helicopter are sourced from abroad. The Tejas LCA and the Arjun tank also have high percentage of foreign components. While the warship building program has made indigenization a priority, 60% of the weapons and sensors in most Indian built warships continue to be sourced from abroad, including in the recently launched aircraft carrier INS Vikrant. We have two kinds of need. Firstly, the deficiencies must be made up as quickly as possible. In that, money is not the only problem. The procedures need to be straightened out to give confidence to the outsiders who are willing to invest into India in various uh, infrastructure developments. Is they have to be confident that the country is secure, and of course the procedure should be simplified so that they do not run from pillar to post and hit a wall ultimately. Currently, there are 17 main companies in India that are into defence manufacturing. They service approximately 12 lakh strong armed forces in what happens to be the third largest army, the fourth largest air force and the seventh largest navy in the world. The upcoming defence budget has the task of strengthening of all the three defence forces with the help of bringing in more and more latest arms and equipments. Many experts feel that the key issue is not indigenization alone, but also the export policies that govern defence equipments. The government has announced its intention to simplify procedures so that more firms can invest in defence manufacturing. While the government continues to be persistent about its Make in India policy, when it comes to indigenization in the defence sector, a lot of questions are raised. With the union budget just round the corner, hopes are high over more and more allocations for indigenization and make in India in the defence sector as well. Palak Sharma in New Delhi for Rajya Sabha TV. And now let's get you some quick news from the World Cup. New Zealand survived a minor scare to record their second win tournament of the tournament today, beating Scotland by three wickets. New Zealand won the toss and elected to field, putting up a disciplined show to bundle out the Scottish team for just 142 runs. Chasing a low total wasn't completely a one-sided contest, though. The Kiwis kept losing wickets at regular intervals. They did get home, but with just three wickets to spare, making it a comprehensive but unconvincing win in the end. Uh, Williamson top scored for New Zealand with 38 runs. New Zealand also won their last match against oh, Sri Lanka well by 98 runs. Down. Yeah, that's, another one goes. The in the now. He that's it on the news at 6. Keep watching Rajasabha TV.